Well, we're up here in Minnesota to visit a real special person, uh, Coach Murray Womath, who uh, I met when I was a junior in high school. And he is the, probably the oldest living Tennessee Letterman, University of Tennessee Letterman in football. He's 96 years old. I've been about to see Coach Womath about every other year for the last 15 or 20 years or longer. It's the people that have been around Murray Womath have great respect for him, number one, because he's smart. He's a demanding coach. He knew fundamentals as well as anybody who ever coached. He knows coach technique and made a big mark on me and a big imprint on me. They don't make them like him anymore. I, uh, I think everybody that played for General Neyland has used what we probably call the Tennessee game maxims. Yeah. Play for it and make the breaks. Yeah. When one comes your way, score. I imagine you and the team making the fewest mistakes will win. Anything that you recall that, that pertains to to the winning football games about the game maxims? Well, <clears throat> they've been uh, my Bible. I recite them and I've, I recited them and I have them written down where I can see them in my view. And they've been a, a kind of a stepping stone for my life. I lived uh, uh, right by those maxims. Play for and make the breaks when one comes your way, square. Carry the fight to them and keep them there all afternoon. If at first the break or play goes against you, don't slow down. Put on the most steam. Yeah, I, I know them all. And, uh, How about that? And I've lived by that. And I got to laughing the other day. Somebody says, golly, he says, it's kind of like a thing of life, isn't it? You know, I said, hell yes, that's what it is. I just tells you, we all live and be happy. To be happy is to win. Now, all you got to do to be happy is win. That's right. That's that ought to tell you something about how hard you ought to work. That ought to tell you when you work, what you're working for, and you just keep that up and look at it. 1960, Coach Earl Blake, who you coached for at Army as an assistant, and Vince Lombardi coached for him, and many other people did. But I read his book, You Have to Pay the Price, the Earl Blake story. And he had mentioned the game maxims that he played for at West Point. He played for Colonel Charles Daly, and so did General Neyland. General Neyland, General Eisenhower, and General Omar Bradley, and General Van Fleet, who was a leader of the uh, Army in Korea, all four played on the 1916 team and got those game maxims from Colonel Daly back in 1916. Earl Blake used those at Army. Murray Womath used them at Minnesota and Mississippi State. Bowden White used them at Wyoming, Arkansas, and Tennessee. Yeah. Harvey Robinson used them. Bobby Dodd used them. Yeah. Bob Woodruff used them. Yeah. DeWitt Weaver used them. So did Phil Diggis. Everybody that coached at Tennessee, including John Majors, used the game maxims that we yeah. call the Tennessee sure game maxims did. that came from West Point in 1916. I never forget the first time I saw them. I was a sophomore starting playing my, not starting, playing my first game for Coach Harvey Robinson, who had succeeded General Neyland. And I see these game maxims. First time I'd ever seen them or ever heard of them. Now that's 1954. Fast forward 10 years later, I'm coaching for Frank Brawls, yeah. who played for one of Tennessee's great players, Bobby Dodd, yeah. the Georgia Tech coach. Yeah. Yeah. Brawls played for Dodd. I'm coaching the defensive backs and the punters. So I go out early with the punters. And nothing's on the blackboard. I come back in after the working with the pregame and Coach Brawls was going to make his final comments, and I look on the blackboard, and I thought, That's, that looks familiar. The team making a few mistakes will win. So it's passed down from General Colonel Daly yeah, to yeah, Eisenhower, yeah, still, Nathan, still, Nathan, still walking right down to Bobby Dodd and to Frank Brawls, who yeah, played for Dodd, yeah. and to the people like uh -huh. Darrell Royal and people that coach for you. They stuck yeah. around for a long, long time. Boy, it has, and it's been successful. Yes, sir. Reed. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, mm -hmm. We all used it and felt it, and I know they did as I did. We weren't just writing something up there to be writing and leaving it on the board. He, the last thing he said to all of us, going out of the dressing room for play, play for and make the breaks when run comes your way, score. And, they, and he said, carry the fight to him and keep it there all afternoon long. I could play right now, Coach. Send me in. Share the fight keep to it. him and keep it there all afternoon long. I'm ready to put my yeah. jock strap on and put my chin strap on. I'd like to play <laughs> right now for you. Well, that's it, just, and I, I, I can give that kind of talk to myself every now and then when I look up and see that name. What the hell are you living for? It's, it's fun to win. <clears throat> Success has a way of creating happiness.
Since you played for General Nealon and also coached for him, was he aloof when you played for him, and when you, or was he different when you coached for him? Oh no, he he was direct, and uh, he got out on your level, except that he meant he everything he said. <laughs> He, he made you give, his father and son talk was real strong. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, if uh, Neelan uh, would convince you that everything he had was right and backed it up and, and you never questioned it really, uh, well, I never did and I never felt any way, but, but that hell, we were lucky to be playing for him and what he said was right and we tried to make it right and uh, always did. And, I never, never knew him to be wrong, or let's say, let me say, unconvinced uh, of his own ideas. Uh, <laughs> he believed in himself, and uh, when he believed in uh, somebody else, and they won with it, he believed in copying it. And he, uh, he wasn't so uh, single-minded that he wouldn't take any idea that he felt was good and use it. How did he influence your coaching career, what you learned from him, as a player and coach, how that affected how you made your decisions or how you had your philosophy and your thinking? Yeah, well, sure as hell did. Of everything that uh, I know about it, uh, I learned from him. You were around Tennessee playing and coaching. If there's one particular rival or maybe two that General Neyland took more pride in beating or got built up for emotionally or mentally, well, that would have been any one of them. <laughs> uh, I don't know that uh, uh, he wasn't buddy buddy or friendly with any of them either. Uh, I mean, you know, he kind of felt like they were bad guys. Uh, I think <clears throat> he and his uh, conflicts with Alabama were greater. I mean, I think that was more nearly a 50-50 thing. If anything, I think Tennessee beat, beat Alabama more. The, the year when he was there, <clears throat> but they were they let blood. Yep. Yeah. They they that that was the anticipation that uh, if you kill them, it's all right. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> <laughs> he knew how, he knew how to win. <laughs> Tennessee and Alabama. Uh, a, a guy hit hit bad and wide. He was rushing a punt. And the protecting back that he runs by, he hit wide in the jaw. And boy, he broke the hell out of his jaw and turned it around. They had to hold Mr. Watt from stands. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah they, they had to, the people had to grab, grab his father when they saw that. He, he hit him in the foot. Coach Real White man. never failed to mention that when we played Alabama. I said, they broke my damn jaw. I've hated them ever since. Alabama broke my jaw. He reminded us that every year we played against him. Is that so? Yep. yep. He very uh, rarely, he didn't lose to Alabama very often. But it seemed to me like we beat them all the time. <laughs> but that was, that, was the, that, was the, that was the one that we were all the time loading for. We were beat Alabama, beat Alabama. That, I, think, I think he got the Vanderbilt rivalry quieted in four or five years. <clears throat> they just were another team after that. I mean, they, he still hated, hated them and all, but they couldn't win enough to, yeah. he never lost any sleep with them. Yeah. We beat them all the time. I can tell what kind of person you are and how much respect you have in this community and from your former players uh, every time I come, somebody's here to see you normally that played for you or knows you or knew your wife. The people have so much respect for you in Tennessee and wherever you've ever been. You've touched people that will be, they'll forget you as long as they live. So my congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the time very much. It's <laughs> always a treat to be with you. It really is. <laughs>
And he and Bowden White, my head coach for two years at Tennessee, started their early coaching career at Mississippi State uh, for Alan McKean. Now, did you all did you all play a little handball down there? Yeah. Did, were you there? Did you see the fight between Coach Wyatt and Alan McKean? Yes, I did. <laughs> did did you stop it? Oh, well, hell no! I didn't want to stop it because I was one-sided in it. <laughs> But I tell you, I was ashamed of both of them. It wasn't, God damn, I could have whipped either both of them at the same time. They, neither one of them knew how to fight. God almighty, they just fluffed death around and rolled around. I, I was ashamed of it. But we closed the, we closed the door and, uh, and uh, let, them, let them go at it. We Handball court and all the people out around there where we were playing the handball court. They threw the ball down and went to swacking. <laughs> I could have whipped them both that day. <laughs> yeah, I never did, saw a worse, worse fight. <laughs> did, 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 did you ever, did you ever do any boxing? Oh yeah, a little. Yeah. Neither yeah. one of them did. <laughs> yeah. I don't think. <laughs> now Tennessee, you played with Breezy Wynn, and you also was. The, we were the, freshmen together. You and Breezy Wynn was a, he was a fullback, and you played end, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, Beatty Feathers was the tailback. You played with Beatty Feathers, didn't yes, you? Yes, we were freshmen together. What you, what, what's, your, uh, what's, what's your thinking about Beatty Feathers as a player? Uh, well, I think he was, and as far as I'm concerned, I think he proved the years that he played was the greatest football player that ever played as, as a ball carrier. Yeah, he, I'm telling you, he unloaded. <laughs> and I never, I've never seen anything run the way he could run. Well, as hard as he did. Yeah. Oh God damn! He, it wasn't. It was. It was cruel. Cruel to see the way he could close to you. Bam! God yeah. damn! If you got up there at the line of scrimmage and there wasn't any hole, he just run up the line lineman's back. All I, all the linemen were scared to not have a hole there because he just go right on up your back and right on out into the air. Just, yeah. Coach Woman, I know what kind of competitor you are. And what a good recruiter you were, because you said you'd like to coach for good football players like I did. <laughs> but I remember when I took the Iowa State job, you were head coach at Minnesota in 1968. And that was my first year. We had a few Minnesota players on our team, but we couldn't normally beat the University of Minnesota in your own backyard up here recruiting. <laughs> but we had a few pretty good players playing for us. And we were up here recruiting in Minnesota. And I'm in my office one day, and I get a call from Coach Mary Warmoth. So naturally, I would accept a call out of respect to Coach Warmoth. And I remember you said, hey, boy, I, uh, you, uh, he says, you went to Tennessee, didn't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, so did I. I said, what are you doing up here trying to recruit these Minnesota, Minnesota players? He says, we, we Tennessee boys have got to look after each other. So <laughs> you need to stay in Iowa and recruit Iowa players. <laughs> you were getting me straight right from the start. <laughs> You want me? They want me coming to your backyard. I don't blame uh, you. Uh, well, Coach, don't shake the chairs off of my street. <laughs> he just—they don't make him like him anymore, and it almost brings tears to your eyes because he's 96 years old. Aren't many other? Aren't many of them around? I believed uh, what I was taught. I don't claim any uh, original ideas at all, except just play like hell and get them if you can. <laughs>